All right, scholars, thanks for tuning in to our lesson on electric power. First, we need to understand electric energy. When we use electric energy, when we plug something in, that electric energy came from the power plant. And that power plant made the electric energy from burning coal or natural gas or some other type of energy source. So let's list some devices and what type of energy they convert electricity to. When we plug in, say, a light bulb, that light bulb is converting the electric energy into um, thermal energy and light or radiant energy. So this is one example. Light bulbs convert electric energy into thermal energy and radiant energy, light. The ideal light bulb would convert electric energy into all radiant energy without producing any thermal energy, but there's always waste heat that's produced. I would like you to pause the video and write down at least one or two examples of other devices that convert electric energy into some other form of energy and try to think of examples that aren't just converting into thermal energy or light energy. So the rate at which the electrical energy is converted into these other forms of energy is called electric power. Electric power is measured in units of, and if you know the answer, go ahead and work ahead of me and then come back to check your answer. Watts, and a watt is defined as a joule of energy per second of time. So think about some devices and what do you have heard about their wattage. Take, take a light bulb for example. It's common to buy a 60 watt light bulb in the hardware store. That 60 watt light bulb converts 60 joules of electric energy into thermal and radiant light energy per second. If you have a 100 watt light bulb, it's brighter because it's converting 100 joules of electric energy um, every second. There is an equation that you'll need to know how to use for electric power, and this is it. P equals IB, current times voltage. Let's take a look at the units here to see how it works out. Current is measured in amps. Volt is measured in, I mean voltage is measured in volts. And what is an amp? An amp is defined to be a coulomb per second. What is a volt? A volt is defined to be a joule per coulomb. Look what happens. The coulombs cancel out. And we have joules per second, which is a watt. So it makes sense here that this equation is used to calculate power because it gives us the correct units for power, which is watt. Let's take a look over here at the example. The label on the back of a toaster says it has, says it has a power of 1500 watts when plugged into a 120 volt outlet. How much current does it draw? So we see power is 1500 watts. We see voltage is 120 volts. And it's asking us to calculate current. So we can use this equation that we know P equals IV. We can plug in our known values. Power is 1500. Voltage is 120. Do some simple algebra here. Divide both sides by 120. And the current is 1500 by 120. Hmm, that's the same as 150 over 12. 150 over 12 is 12.5. And the units, this is current, would be amps. All right, so if you were to use your multimeter and measure the amount of current going through that toaster, it would be 12.5 amps. I'm going to show you a device in class um, on our next class day called a kilowatt that you can use to measure how much current is flowing into or out of any device that you plug into a wall. All right, let's take this one step further. There's another way of writing this equation for power. We're going to do a substitution using Ohm's law. So for Ohm's law, we can write down Ohm's law is voltage equals current times resistance. And if we start with that equation that we have above, P equals IV. But then we substitute in for V, I times R. What we have now is I times I times R, which is which is I squared R. So this is another common way of writing this equation. And it's one that you will have to know how to use. 
we're not doing an example on it here, but we'll do an example in our next class. Wires convert electric energy into thermal energy, as we saw vividly with our demonstration with the car battery. This is called resistive heating, and it is used in a variety of applications, such as, I would like you to write down a few applications that you know of, where we use electric energy flowing through wires to create heat or thermal energy. So go ahead and pause the video, write down some examples. Okay, maybe you came up with a toaster as an example. And tomorrow in class, I'll have you share some more of your examples. Try to have at least three written down. Resistive heating of wires is unavoidable. Anytime you have current going through a wire, it's going to heat it up. And this is undesirable in most cases because it means useful energy is being converted to waste heat. However, special materials called superconductors are able to conduct heat. Ooh, that's not conduct heat. Are able to conduct electricity. Typo. Please fix that. With zero resistance, meaning zero energy loss. These are amazing materials. We think of them as being um, new modern materials, but actually superconductivity was discovered about 100 years ago. But it was only made practical in the 1980s when special superconductors were developed that could operate at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And I say that that's special because um, most superconductors only work at even colder temperatures than liquid nitrogen, like liquid hydrogen or liquid, actually liquid helium temperatures, which is like 4 Kelvin. So liquid nitrogen is cold stuff. It's 78 Kelvin. But at that temperature, um, certain types of ceramic materials will become superconductors. And that means if you get electric current flowing in them, it will continue forever with absolutely zero electrical resistance. Forever, as long as you keep it cool. These materials are pretty expensive, and it's very expensive to keep them cool with liquid nitrogen. So they're not all that practical in most cases. But we have built computers using superconductor uh, materials, and these computers are extremely fast. We would like to, we would love to have a superconductor material that did not have to be cooled using liquid nitrogen one that could operate at room temperature. And so there's this dream of somebody inventing the room temperature superconductor. Uh, if this is the case, then we could actually run our electric power um, from our electric power plants to our homes without having any loss of energy. As it is right now, about 30% of that energy is converted to heat as the electricity is flowing um, in the wires that you see you know, going across the desert, um, going across the mountains, going along our streets. Those wires are all giving off heat into the air, and so we're losing that energy. There's only one place in the world where we do use superconductor wires to transmit energy from electric power plant to homes or businesses, and that's near New York City, where there's one area they had to get more electricity to, and in order to do it the conventional way, they would have had to have torn up and moved a freeway. So what they decided instead was to suffer the expense of using superconductor materials to, um, to reroute it in a more convenient way. And um, even though it's expensive to use the liquid nitrogen to keep it cold and to produce the superconductor wires in the first place, that expense has been offset by the fact that they didn't have to move the freeway, which is also very expensive to do. Okay, check out part two of our lesson here. It's on the electrical use of appliances in your household.